Well, good evening, and I'd like to call to order this committee the whole meeting of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome, uh, extend a welcome to everyone in the chambers this evening. The first order of business is a declaration of pecuniary interest, and I'll remind every member of your responsibility you can do so now or when it arises on the agenda. If we have nothing, then uh, under additions and deletions or amendments to the, to the agenda, I've been asked to uh, ask leave of committee to add Maria Bertrand. She's here this evening representing... VPI as a delegation, and we could add her as the third delegation if there's no objection from committee. And so noted, then we'll add you. The, we have you'll be the third, Maria. Welcome. <coughs> Excuse me. And the next item is uh, delegations, and we, uh, as I said, we now have three. And the first delegation is Matt Jackson. He's the municipal affairs manager from Union Gas Franchise, and I believe he has Jeremy Miller with him. And so, welcome, gentlemen. If you want to come to the podium, uh, just press the little blue button and. Well, thank you for uh, having Union Gas here this evening. I'm Jeremy Miller. I'm the Utility Services Manager for Union Gas in the Owen Sound, Saugeen Shores, Hanover area. So we just wanted to come. We are uh, negotiating a franchise agreement this year. I know the franchise agreement has been uh, uh, given to the town, and uh, hopefully you've all had a look at it so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just kind of explaining a little bit about Union Gas, natural gas, and what we do. And then Matt Jackson is our Municipal Affairs Manager. Did I give you a promotion again, or are you still the manager? <laughs> And uh, he's going to give you more on the franchise agreement and how things work that way. But basically, uh, Union Gas is the second largest natural gas distributor in Ontario. Uh, we have about 1.4 million customers, residential and commercial. Uh, we have 2,300 employees, and we pay over $70 million in taxes every year to the uh, province of Ontario, which is a little stat that a lot of people don't know, that we're the only utility that pays uh, taxes to the communities that we work and grow in and, and live in. Waterloo Brantford District is who uh, Owen Sound Saugeen Shores is a part of. We basically go from Port Rowan up to Wyarton. Uh, my area is the uh, uh, Owen Sound area. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. About 8,800 kilometers of pipe, 278 employees in this area. We pay about $11.8 million in taxes. We did it in 2016. Our head office is in Cump uh, Drive in Waterloo. So the Saugeen Shores area, basically, uh, we service about 5,800 customers. We have about 174 kilometers of pipe, and in 2016, we paid roughly uh, $89,000 in taxes to your municipality. About a third of that would be to, uh, to you directly, a third to the school board and a third to the upper tier uh, government. So that's what we like to have. Our, uh, I have two offices, one in Owen Sound, one in Hanover, and we have 12 USRs, which are utility service reps that work, and you'll see them in the trucks, in the field, fixing the gas lines, uh, setting the meters, and uh, looking after inspections in the area. Uh, we do have a strong community support. We work with United Way, Warm Winter, uh, the fire department training. I actually personally do the training for the fire departments in the area. So um, uh, Chief Eagleson and myself, we've also done the fire training or uh, natural gas first responder training for your uh, police force as well. So that's something we take pride in. And actually, uh, two years ago, we were able to donate 30 smoke detectors and CO detectors for your fire department when they go to a scene and they don't have them, they could actually install them. So that's kind of what we do. Matt's going to touch now on, uh, I'll let you get out of the way here, Matt, and I'll run our slides. Great. So thanks, uh, Your Worship, members of council, thanks for having us tonight. Lots of familiar faces in the room, so good to see everyone. I thought I'd make a joke about the media and how they're so much nicer to you guys down here than they are us in South Bruce Peninsula, but <laughs> I digress. Anyways, great to be here. Uh, just quickly, um, so my name is Matt Jackson, the manager of municipal affairs and also a councillor up in the beautiful... Uh, municipality of South Bruce Peninsula. So just quickly uh, talk about the benefits of natural gas. So in Ontario we've been talking a lot about the cost of energy. Uh, often the electricity uh, dialogue is taking the majority of the uh, media time. Uh, the, the real reality has been that energy prices in Ontario when it comes to natural gas have been stable and actually on the downward trend for the last number of years. So the five sort of top benefits of natural gas we often talk about, so lower energy prices, so uh, the natural gas sector is providing energy at lower rates today than they were paying uh, 10 years ago which has led to a strength in the economy. So as um, companies have been struggling with their electricity costs in Ontario, the downward trend in natural gas has offered a, a bit of a buffer there. We've seen a lot of industries who were on the way out uh, from North America that are energy intensive with the abundance of natural gas in North America starting to look to onshore their, their business again. Uh, obviously a safe uh, commodity, so the natural gas industry is heavily regulated and takes safety very, very seriously. 
and we're quite proud of that. As well in Ontario, we're proud of the fact that natural gas has allowed the province to shift away in partnership with renewables from coal electricity generation. So uh, we've played a big part in that, which has led to significant reduction in carbon dioxide and particulate matter. And then finally, but probably one of the most important is um, energy security and the fact that uh, supplies in North America now are estimated to be abundant for at least 150 years. That number now is likely closer to two or 250 years. I keep finding more. So we're in a good spot um, geographically to benefit from those in Ontario for our industries and our customers. This graph here just sort of shows the cost spread between the cost of heating the average home with natural gas versus other forms of, of energy. So. You can see there on the bottom line, uh, the average home is paying less than $1,000, closer to about 900 in uh, southern Ontario to heat their home. That would be for the, the heat and the hot water. Uh, and then the lines above are other forms of conventional uh, energy, so propane, furnace oil, and electricity. And as you can see, that cost spread is significant, especially when we're looking at the cost of electricity. Obviously, propane and oil have been on a bit of a downward trend over the last number of years, but the spread is still between $1,500 and $2,000 a year versus the competing um, energy form. So a real competitive advantage there for customers that have access to natural gas. I'd just like to talk to this slide when we're presenting to councils. As I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of dialogue in Ontario about increasing energy costs. Um, if you look at this graph here, the line at the bottom, so that blue line is really where um, Union Gas um, makes its profit and recovers its costs of running our business. Um, so as you can see, that cost uh, in July 2013 versus January 2016, pretty well consistent. And that is something that we're quite proud of. Uh, we've worked really hard as a utility to keep our costs low, uh, to keep our service affordable, uh, and that's in part because of our regulated framework, but also because we work hard to find those efficiencies year over year. So really proud of that consistent trend. We're the lowest, provi lowest cost provider of natural gas in Ontario, and we work really hard to, to stay that way. So the line in the middle, the green, is the cost of transporting the gas to Ontario, so either from Western Canada or uh, the shale plays in the northern, northeastern eastern part of the U.S., and then the commodity cost is a free market cost. So those costs are basically passed on through the customer. So at Union Gas, we don't make any profit off the commodity. It's simply passed on, and those, mar those prices fluctuate on the open market. So that's where the, the volatility can come from. If you remember that super cold winter we had, we had a bit of a spike. That's why the one year was higher. And just quickly, Jeremy alluded to this a little bit, but we like to talk about our involvement and our investments in communities. So we believe in giving back to the communities we operate. One of the reasons I'm probably the most proud to work for Union Gas is the amount of work that we do in the communities we serve. So uh, in 2016, we donated over 3.3 million to local charities and provided over $1 million in low-income assistance to our customers who are struggling uh, with their energy bills. And then beyond that, over 19,000 hours of employee volunteer engagement in the communities we serve. And then the reason we're here tonight. So uh, probably most of you in the room remember when Union Gas came to uh, Sogging Shores back in the 90s. Uh, we do that under uh, an approval from the Ontario Energy Board. So we are regulated by the Ontario Energy Board. Um, and basically what we're here today to talk about is the franchise agreement. So the franchise agreement is really the right uh, that the board gives to us on behalf of your constituents to service um, natural gas within your community. And it's approved by the board and it basically outlines the terms and conditions that Union Gas and the municipality will operate under. And we like to refer to this as sort of the how-to operating document. So it lays out a number of terms and conditions that we, we abide by uh, to have the privilege of operating in your right-of-way. And then uh, beyond that is the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. So that's really uh, the right to construct and operate the natural gas system that's granted after the franchise agreement in its original state. The Certificate of Public Convenience doesn't expire. It lasts in perpetuity. Uh, and basically it's a process we go through when we originally apply to serve the community that proves that we're the most competitive option and that the, the rights of the interests of the customers have been looked after. So it really gives us the permission to operate the system once it's built.
So a little bit about the history of Union Gas with Sogging Shores. So the original franchise agreement was signed in 1997. Uh, it was signed on June 23rd, 1997 for a 20 year term. So these are standard agreements set by the Ontario Energy Board and they are 20 years uh, in time. This new one will have the option for a renewal at seven years and 14 years if there are any changes to that standard agreement from the board. Uh, the current agreement is the 2000 model agreement which was negotiated by AMO, uh, individual municipalities and the gas utilities and approved by the board. And we have the same agreement with over 200 municipalities across the province and it basically governs how we operate near right away. So it lays out a process for us obtaining permits, it talks about restoration being to your satisfaction or you can bill us um, to make sure that it, it gets done, uh, relocation, cost sharing provisions, abandonments and many other terms. So it really outlines how we work together on a day to day basis. So that is um, really a quick background. So basically Union Gas has been a proud and important member of the Soggy and Shores community for the past 20 years and we just wanted to say thank you for that partnership. Uh, we believe uh, that working in partnership with the municipality we've helped support growth and prosperity uh, and we're seeking your approval um, to continue that relationship and to submit that application for renewal to the board. So just quickly the next steps then are council resolution where you give first and second reading to the, the resolution and bylaw uh, that was provided. Uh, we then submit that to the Ontario Energy Board. They go through a, a process where there's some public notifications and a formal approval by the board and then we return those documents to the municipality once that approval has been granted by the Energy Board for a third reading and final sign off and that's really the end of the process. Um, so yeah that can take about two to three months, sometimes up to four months. So um, that was all we had uh, for today. If there are any questions we're happy to take them and again thank you for the partnership we have and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you Jer <coughs> Jeremy and Matt. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Dave Mayette. Uh, thanks, thanks, Matt, and thanks, Jeremy, for for outlining all that stuff. And uh, and certainly, everybody that lives in Soggy Insurance appreciates the advantages that having gas here does. And I, I only wish that the gas line went out as far as I live, but it doesn't. So uh, I'll continue to burn uh, what I call biomass, but it's a wood stove anyway. But uh, I digress. Um, the uh, the new franchise agreement uh, is there going to be an opportunity? For or will there be a, like a formal negotiation take place between Union Gas and the municipality as far as the terms of that agreement go? And, and specifically what I'm talking about, and I believe I've talked to you before about it, is that uh, in 1997, uh, now I know the date, June 23rd, 1997, that agreement was outlined and, it, and certainly it, uh, it talked about, you know, serv serving the, the majority of the municipality in the urban centres. And, uh, and I, I believe that it went on to say that in time that it would expand to the less dense urban area. So we have a couple of urban areas that are sort of on the fringe and maybe don't uh, have the density of, uh, of a you know in town neighborhood that would certainly like to see a gas line you know go into there. Was this the opportunity where we uh, visit some of those concepts? There's kind of a Two answers to that question. So the first answer on the <coughs> franchise agreement itself. So their standard agreement sort of just they outline basically the how we operate. So it sets out the terms and conditions. Hopefully you can hear me uh, for how we operate. So there's nothing in there about sort of where Union Gas will serve versus where we weren't. It's simply an operating agreement. Uh, in terms of uh, expanding natural gas within the municipality, uh, certainly we're not in the business of not putting pipe in the ground. We're a pipeline operator and we look for every opportunity to put pipe where we can. Uh, that said, just like the operating agreements we have uh, that are set and approved by the Ontario Energy Board, the same sort of, um, there's a, a similar regulatory process that mandates the the economic threshold that Union Gas has to meet to expand. So let's say there's a pocket just outside of Southampton, you know, uh, 10 kilometers from the gas main and only 100 customers. Uh, we basically cost out, uh, and any utility in Ontario would cost out that expansion uh, the same, and we would have to meet the same economic threshold. So there has just been a, a process taking place uh, at the Ontario Energy Board where they've looked at those rules. Um, they've looked at the economic thresholds. Um, the reality is we'll put gas anywhere, um, but those projects have to meet that economic threshold over a 40 year period. If they don't, that's what we call the customer contribution, the gap between what that project would generate in terms of revenue and what the costs are. And to prevent utilities from having current customers cross-subsidize the attachments of new customers, much like municipalities and 
the growth pays for growth philosophy, we're actually unable to cross-subsidize in between. So if those projects on their own aren't economic, we have to look for a way to fill that gap. <clears throat> so that said, the board has just rendered a new decision. Union Gas has been at the forefront of the dialogue in Ontario, pushing for new regulatory approaches and new revenue tools to uh, bring gas to new communities. Um, we're filing the first sort of phase of what we hope is a multi-year phase. Um, that said, without knowing the specifics, my guess is there's probably still an economic gap, but we certainly could take a look at those communities anytime. So um, that was a long-winded answer. Um, but to answer shortly, um, yeah, that, that's good. Perfect. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, guys, for coming in. I just wondered, uh, the date is interesting to me of the, of the, of the existing contract, 1997. Is that a pre-amalgamation contract? Is the contract you have now with the town of Saugeen Shores, or is it actually with the towns of Port Elk and Southampton and the township of Saugeen? It's with the three. So this one will be the first time it's been amalgamated. And, so there were, sorry. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. I just, I guess, uh, I just wonder, is, and there, and there are agreements, existing agreements with all three of those previous entities. That we're not. This new agreement doesn't extend it into an agreement into territory where it didn't exist before. No. So basically, the agreement. So the franchise agreement is for the entire municipality. Right. Um, it's that certificate of public convenience that talks about the geographical boundaries. So you could have technically overlapping franchise agreements with various utilities. The Certificate of Public Convenience sets out that geographic boundary. So the boundary will be amalgamated now. So we've had to go through this with a number of municipalities that are renewing for the first time. It will become a comprehensive agreement for the amalgamated municipality, but the certificates won't change. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Minaj. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So to follow up on that then, I think we heard you say you're willing to look at it. Can we, can we strike a, a good hard bargain that says you will? work with our director of public works and, and uh, maybe do some mapping and, and, and look at it and say, no, that didn't work. Yes, that one will. And, and so we know for sure going forward because we won't maybe come back again for another 20 years. Right. And that's something our construction and growth department will do at any time. We'll look at these projects. If they make feasible sense, we'll go there. And if not, then we won't. Also with our uh, GIS, our mapping system, I'm not sure what you mean, mapping system. We're willing to share that mapping system with the municipalities so that when you're doing any pre-engineering and things like that, that it's a little easier for you to do that without uh, involving Union Gas. Now, there's certain stipulations around that as well, but that also gets you to where you want to go, gives you an idea what we already have. Any further questions? I, I have one. I guess my question goes back to I, recently the minister has announced that they're, you know, they're quite active about extending natural gas, and there's a bunch of money available, I believe $100 million dollars. Uh, I guess my question is: Is uh, I'm sure you people are make, are going to be taking advantage of that, or hopefully will, in this in in our areas here. Yeah. So just a little bit of background on that. So we've sort of been championing that since well, 2013 was about when this real dialogue started. Um, so we've been very active in that process. Uh, we are excited about the news uh, about the increase in grants. Um, so we've got 30 communities that we had identified. Uh, well, that was an application for 30. So we sort of view that first 30 as the first tranche um, that, that we run the economics on. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't other projects out there that we aren't aware of yet that, that may be feasible under these new frameworks. So absolutely we're engaged almost on a, you know, daily basis with municipalities across the province looking at these. So if there are pockets of the community that aren't served where you maybe know there's future growth coming or there's been growth that's maybe changed the economics, certainly feel free to pass those on. We've got a, a growth team that's out there often looking for these projects as well, but certainly it never hurts for us to hear uh, from communities where there's interest. Even if you're getting calls from constituents, sometimes that helps us understand what the level of interest in. So yes, we're very involved in that first uh, $100 million. We hope that's a multi-year commitment because uh, we know that there's a, a number of communities that are, you know, some of them not even as fortunate as this community with no access that are looking. So um, we hope that that's going to be a positive contributor. And on our end, you know, we're doing things on a daily basis to look at how we can lower our costs in terms of construction. How can we work with municipalities, maybe to, you know, joint trench or the municipalities maybe rebuilding a road. Maybe we can partner and put the gas in with them at the same time. So we are quite active on that, trying to drive the cost down as best we can. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jeremy and Matt. Thanks.
Okay. We're just having some uh, difficulty with our online webcast. But we will go to our next uh, delegation then. And uh, our next delegation is here. They are, it is uh, Mike Bonnard. He's here from the Sogging Shores Life Saving Club. And welcome, our award winning club, I must say. Welcome, Mike. And uh, just please introduce who's with you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you guys for your time tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Bonner, and with me are Aurora Jacoby and Maddie McDeal. We are members of the Sogging Shores Life Saving Club. Tonight we have come to share with you information about our fifth annual polar bear dip, taking place Monday, February 20th at 10 a.m. at Port Elgin, Main Beach. This is SSLC's biggest fundraiser of the year, with all proceeds going towards equipment, including crafts and assisting athletes in their training. Life saving sport has been the growth in Sogging Shores since it started in 2009. Over the past four years, the polar bear dip has raised money to purchase additional equipment, allowing our sport of life saving to grow in Sogging Shores. This fundraiser will help to continue to make sure athletes uh, have the needed equipment to train and compete while allowing for future growth and exposing more athletes to life saving sport. Last summer, there were over 80 athletes between the ages of 5 and 65 training on Port Elgin, Main Beach. A critical part of SSLC and life saving sport is giving back. Senior athletes coach or volunteer as officials or in equipment crews at competitions for younger athletes. Junior athletes aged 11 to 16 mentor and coach new athletes in the Sea Monster Nipper groups on the beach in the summer. Um, all athletes are taught water safety above all else and um, the dangers of open water. No matter the skill level, athletes always train with a buddy or have a spotter when they train to, and learn the importance of making sure that you do not go out in conditions that are above your ability. These drowning prevention methods will hopefully stay with the athletes for the life. SSLC athletes are competitive at regional, provincial, and national levels because of all of the support and encouragement from individuals and businesses in Sogging Shores. Athletes will, would like to thank everyone that has supported SSLC athletes over the years in their pursuit of their goals in life-saving sport. Whether it has been financial, kind words of encouragement, coming out to one of the events SSLC is hosting, or competing at one of, or at, or in competing at and see what life-saving sport is all about. Thank you for your time, and we hope that you will come out to cheer us on as we take a plunge on Family Day. Thank you very much, Mike. I don't know if the committee wants to say anything, but I guess just to re, re, um, maybe again just tell us it's going to be Family Day or the, and the time. So yes, just to say it again. It's uh, on Family Day, so coming up uh, next Monday at 10 a.m. at the main beach. Very well. Can anybody join? No, All right. That <laughs> not, not that I'm volunteering. <laughs> <coughs> you will? I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation, and I hope you raise lots of money. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, our third delegation is Maria Bertrand. She's here for VPI, and welcome, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm Maria Bertrand with the Adult Learning Centre, and this is Tina Rupert. She's with VPI, the employment agency. Thank you very much for your time. We're just here. We were two years ago just to give you an update on what we're doing. The Adult Learning Centre covers Bruce Gray down to Georgian, so we have a pretty big um, area to cover, and Tina covers mainly Bruce County. We're under the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development. The reason we're here today is just to let you know that there are services in this community for anybody. We're working with, um, in the last year, we've been working with Fanshawe College in Georgian to bring some training into our area so that we can get ready for Bruce Power. So we have welding and millwright right now going on in Tiverton, so we have youth there. We train 
anybody. We're getting people to finish their GED, finish their high school credits. We're working with businesses. We're working with math and aptitude testing. So if people are not doing well on the, on the math, in order to get into Bruce Power, please come and see us because we have tests and we'll test you to death until you know your math. So we're working with those sorts of folks in our community. Just so you know, it's, we're a government program, so there is no cost to use our services unless you have to go write the GED or do a credit. We'll let you know up front what kind of costs there are. Now some of our folks are 18 and some of my folks are 77 years old. So we work on computer skills as well just to get people ready for any jobs. And we do have people, by the way, in their 70s who are looking for work. <laughs> uh, Tina will talk to you a little bit about what they do because I want to keep this short because um, she will talk about some of the services in our community for youth. The last time we were here, um, our dream is to have an innovation center here in Saugeen Shores. We don't have room. We don't have buildings big enough. I did talk to a local builder, Andrew Hill, and he said, yes, you could mention his name. He's interested in being the builder, but we're non-for-profit, so we can't. We don't have the capital. So if anybody has a lot of money and wants to build a building, we'll rent it. So that's what we're looking for in the future. Um, again, if people don't know what we do, they can phone us. We, um, we have people in all the time working on, on, on the skills they need. Some people are worried about Bruce Power because it's going to take away from other jobs. But I think that if somebody goes to Bruce Power, that just opens up another job in our community. You will see in the next few years businesses hopefully coming into our area and the training. So we're willing to train anybody. I'll let Tina finish up. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, as part of the government and the youth initiative that is happening over the last two years, there's been some new youth programs that have come out to support all youth in our communities throughout Bruce County and throughout Ontario. They're youth that are barriered, youth that are mostly removed from the employment sector. They may be youth that haven't finished high school because that is the traditional way that they want to go through. So these programs, there's um, there are 60 hours of instructional with us. Uh, so they talk about... Um, labor market research, they talk about the the laws and, you know, the common sense things of showing up on time, that relationship with the employer, the respect, those types of things. They're pre-employment workshops that the individual is paid to attend. So with that, we move them through and, and there's a huge mentor um, component of this. So they stay with us and we help them break down all those barriers, the things that they might be dealing with and, and lots of referrals within the community if it's mental health, if it's the food bank, um, housing, all of these um, barriers that these young individuals have and then they work one-on-one -on -one with a job developer and the employer and the mentorship piece continues on so we help them find that first job and to become a valued member in their community and um, we've seen great success with the program and we just want to make sure that everybody knows that this program is here for these youth between the ages of 15 and 29 they could have finished high school they might not have finished high school we support some individuals that have their grade 9 we're supporting some that have their grade 12 so um, just like with Maria we service the whole community so we have itinerant offices in Kincard and Port Elgin we go to Southampton we're in Wyerton in the summertime we're up to Tobamori so what I'm asking is if you know of individuals that would benefit from these programs to please send them our way there is also a summer component for Youth that are looking for that first job, there's uh, 20 hours of uh, in, in class, we want to say, where they're paid minimum wage to come and attend these classes with us, and they work one-on-one -on -one again with a job developer to find that summertime employment that may lead on once they go back to school um, as a part-time job and then move on into different careers. We do lots of labor market research with them um, where they want to locate, maybe relocate where they want to live within this community, what that looks like. So along with our other employment programs our focus right now is on the youth programs and then just to keep it really short we have the Canada Ontario job grant that is for employers to train new or existing employees so you as a business if you want to retrain your staff or you want to hire new staff and you're um, looking for some skills upgrading there is grants money there available for that as an employer so I just want to make sure that you guys know that that's out there too so, okay thank you Thank you, Marie and Tina. I'm sure there's some questions. Questions from committee? Councillor Dave Mayup. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, 
Thank you, Tina and Marie, for coming out. It's great work you're doing. Um, just a couple questions about the how people access it. Do you guys have a website? And uh, you mentioned give us a call. And uh, and are, do you have a presence physically in? I think it was Maple Square Mall yeah, last time. Yeah, Maple Square Mall. Okay. Tina and I share an office there. Yeah. So right. we're co-located in all of our offices because we work with a lot of um, mutual clients. So it makes okay. it nice to make that transition from our supports to Maria's support. You just Google Adult Learning Center. And we should be first. Uh, all so, right. Yeah, if people are looking for that. So whether you're an employer or whether you're a prospective employee. We'll find, we'll find the, going, there's no, yeah, there's no wrong door, I guess. Mm -hmm. If you come in, uh, we'll direct you to the right place. Yeah. Okay. For example, if you're coming in and uh, you want to do your GED and then I find out that you want to be a, go into a, become a paramedic or a nurse, he's not going to cut it. We have to do ACE. That's a program that we do at Georgian College. So that's our job is to make sure you're in the right right place. And these are for folks that are coming back who are retraining. About 35% of our, my students are retraining. They're working. They're just trying to get their, just to move up in their jobs or move into an apprentice. Excellent. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, guys. I just wonder, have you guys ever spoken or done a delegation uh, with our Economic Development Advisory Committee? I just think it would be a good idea for you guys to connect with the Economic Development Committee of the municipality. I mean, they're working directly on some of these economic development issues. I'm particularly interested in the comments you made about work you're doing to prepare people to get jobs at Bruce Power, uh, jobs that are obviously coming to the region, and uh, that, uh, you know, we want local people. Hopefully local people will get them first because uh, we want local people to be employed. So. Um, and I just know that there's a lot of there's a lot going on there right now. Our economic development advisory committee is the most plugged in in the municipality what to what's happening there and to what some of the needs are. And and when you talk about your desire to uh, to build a, an innovation center, um, you know, and and some of the other things that are happening and with, with regard to innovation in the community, with regard to Bruce Power and other things, I mean, there's just a lot happening. And maybe you could have a more detailed discussion at that level with that committee and make some progress. So. Yeah, we'll that was that. my God. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to read. I think, and I, I think just get a hold of our CAO and David here, and he can get you in touch with that. I think it's a great idea. To, there's opportunities here on both sides to to, to make this grow. Because I, I think what we're doing through the through that economic development and through the county is looking at the needs that are uh, what the needs that that people like you and people coming to this community need, and then trying to match them up with developers and, and those types of things. So right, and there's a lot, lot of grants and a lot of yeah. dollars that. We may know about and, and if yeah I'm sure David can, can direct you to that and it's a great idea thanks Luke. Uh, Councillor Minaj. Thank you Mr. Mayor I, I was particularly interested in the the, the wording of innovation center and um, I wondered too if you could uh, add that when you meet with the economic development committee if you but you do explain what an innovation center square footage requirements how, how it would how it would work for you so that we can have that information as well. I have lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I, and I think yeah. that, that uh, who knows, they call them community hubs. Yes. We, we're, we're, you know, we may be faced with a school that, mm -hmm. that has space mm -hmm. and, and might work for an innovation center. So, like, like keep that thought going. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, ladies. So I guess we'll move on to the next item on the agenda then, which is a staff report back and our Director of Community Services, Jane, is going to present. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Uh, you've got the report in front of you. Really, we're looking for approval this evening to proceed with awarding uh, M. Key Shaw Climate Care as a preferred contractor to install a new HVAC system for both the municipal office and the police um, station. If approved tonight, uh, they could certainly commence at the end of February with the completion date in early spring. And this will certainly alleviate some of the um, discomforts, the issue with um, environmental issues that we've had with both of the facilities. And, uh, you can see the financial impact is uh, $2,850,000, um, which is allocated in the, capital, in the community services capital budget. Thank you, Jane. So the recommendation is that Council approves Empke Schwab Climate Care as the preferred contractor to install the new HVAC units at the municipal office and police offices at a cost of $286,227 plus HST. Questions, comments? Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jane, could you give us a little more detail on why we need to sole source this particular 
one. I mean, there's a lot of contractors out there in the HVAC business. Why do we need a sole source to Emke Shop? Um, there's no doubt about it. We do an awful lot of business in this facility with Emke Shop. They are our service provider. They know the building. They were the original installer as well. Uh, there is a strong comfort level um, in going with Emke Shop. They've done a design build. Um, process which DEI is certainly uh, has they've reviewed with them and they are in, in agreement it's the best route to go so uh, certainly it's familiarity of the building is far exceeds anything else at this point I'm just um, you know with the greatest respect I'm just concerned about that um, as logic for sole sourcing it when you know sole sourcing is one of those things you do when you under a very narrow range of situations for example when there's nobody else who does a thing Right, and and in this case, there's lots of people that do the thing. Uh, familiarity with the building and an HVAC system. I mean, it's an HVAC system, right? I mean, you could you don't have to hire the same contractor over and over again to look after your HVAC system. You can hire somebody who, you know, you can you can take that to tender. I just don't I just don't see the, uh, you know, and if it's a question of price, I mean, the only way to know, really, what the whether somebody can do this cheaper or. Uh, or whether this is the cheapest possible way to do it is to take that to a competitive bidding process and find out, right? I, I uh, you know, and I understand there's some extenuating circumstances, but even taking into account the extenuating circumstances, I think there's, you know, we should have, give the opportunity to to other contractors to to bid on this one. Particularly, you know, it's nearly a three hundred thousand dollar project, and and I'm a little uncomfortable too because M. K. Shab is is the sort of the descendant of the company that originally did this HVAC work in these buildings and and we have problems with the HVAC systems in this building so sole sourcing to the same company that built the system that we're replacing 17 years later I just am uncomfortable with that so I think I mean I, I would like to see us I would like to see us take the thing out to tender if MK comes back and gives us the the best deal uh, the best offer along the lines of what DEI gave us last year and what we recommended and what we put in the 2016 capital budget then then so be it but I would at very least like to see us go through a um, competitive bidding process to see whether we're getting the best deal or not so uh, I'm afraid I can't support the recommendation thank you mr. mayor Councilor Dave my Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My comments were along the same vein in that uh, when you're talking nearly $300,000 that a competitive tendering process would be something that I'd be more comfortable with as well. And, and also just the, the level of uh, detail in the, in the recommendation here, I just, uh, I know that when we, uh, when we analyze the, the possibilities and the options available to us for the and I'm talking specifically about the, the police services building, the current police services building. Uh, there was a, a range of options that we uh, came forward with, and, and one of them was the one that we ended up on. And I'm not sure that I'm able to glean out of this uh, which one that we're settling on, whether we're going with a conventional system or a hybrid system. And uh, I would just like to, and, and, and no, no disrespect to Jane and the work that she's done putting this together, but I think uh, something like this can, can wait a little longer if we uh, put it out to tender. and. And who knows? Maybe we'll get a we'll get a really competitive bidding process going. Any other comments? So I guess procedurally, I would uh, call the vote on the recommendation, unless you want to deal with it any other way. Yeah, I'll call the vote on the recommendation. Then, all in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? That's defeated. So I guess direction then is I guess the direction is pretty clear that we want to go back to a, an RFP process okay Very good the next item on the agenda then is a staff report and it's to do with uh, Chantry Island lease and again Jane Jack will present <coughs> this is uh, typically a housekeeping report a uh, five-year renewal of the lease agreement with the the feds um, and um, this is for the Chantry Island fishing. We've met with them. Uh, we've met with the feds prior to Christmas to review the agreement, and both have concurred that it is satisfactory as it stands. We've added one clause that indicates um, the agreement was modified to purely provide more clarity that no structural work shall occur on the lighthouse tower without prior, prior approval of the departments of fisheries and oceans. Um, and this agreement provides is an annual lease of one dollar a year. 
Uh, the recommendation is the council approves a bylaw to authorize a five-year lease agreement between the town of Saugeen Shores and Her Majesty the Queen as represented by the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans for the leasing of Chantry Island with an expiry date of March the 31st, 2022. Comments? Councillor Dave Mayat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and, and certainly I agree this is a housekeeping item and, and it'll, it'll go through, I'm sure. Just with regards to the, the structures and the lighthouse and the buildings on the, on the island, are they owned by fisheries or are they owned by the municipality? I know with it, uh, through the Marine Heritage Group and the Chantry Island Group, they did a lot of work over the years to put money and rebuild those buildings. I'm just wondering where the ownership uh, that's lies. That's an interesting question. They're owned by the fisheries. Are they? Okay. Further questions? All in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? That's carried. So the next item on the agenda then is a sublease of the Chantry Island to Marine Heritage. And go ahead, Jane. This is part and parcel with the previous lease agreement, um, which we call our parent <coughs> agreement. This is with the Marine Heritage Society, which manages and maintains the Chantry Island staff. Uh, we've met with um, representatives from Marine Heritage Society and re reviewed the agreement. Again, we provide a five-year agreement with them, and this consists of the lands housing, the lighthouse quarters, Imperial Tower, Privy, and the docking area. So the recommendation is that Council approve a bylaw to authorize a sublease agreement with the Marine Heritage Society for subleasing of Chantry Island with an expiry date of March the 31st, 2022. Questions, comments? All in favor? Oh, that's carried. So, there is the uh, next item on the agenda then is, uh, there's, I guess, eight items for com information the committee whole, communications, any issues on any of those individual items? Councillor Minaj, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. I'm just trying to see which one it is, actually. It's the um, Source Protection Committee Minutes, mm -hmm. and it's page 5, and it speaks to a motion that was a recorded vote on doing further analysis to determine whether the transportation of fuels and other hazardous materials, including untreated septage, could potentially be a threat to municipal drinking water sources. Um, my question is, at what point is, is transportation of untreated septage happening in, in our community? I, I, I wanted to know if it's the, the material that we take off the septic beds and we transport out of out of the municipality or is it um, individual private campgrounds or something that co it's collected and is brought to our septic system can I have a further explanation to that please um, I, I think I can partially answer some of it. I, I think what you're talking about is untreated septage would be septage tanks that are treated or are pumped out and transported somewhere and they can go anywhere uh, you know, we have contractors that come into our community and take them out, or they can take them to a treatment plant. They have to take them, and perhaps you can you can address this better than I. But uh, so, sure, go ahead. Then. So, Mr. Mayor, then, so my my question would be: um, I thought we had a lengthy discussion on fuel tankers and. And, I, and I, I thought we did agree that <coughs> maybe a, a big double truck, transport truck with a pup truck of fuel was a, was a potentially hazardous maneuver through our community. And now I see that we're including septic. So, so can we get a follow-up report or something that it can explain how and what we're doing as a municipality work with the SPC in, in, in identifying and controlling those items? I, yeah, I think we can probably get that information for you. I think there's, there's, there's existing legislation. Those will be licensed carriers that will, uh, there'll be existing legislation that will apply to those, those people that are transferring, whether it's fuel, whether it's radioactive material, whether it's septage. They will be licensed by another regulatory body that, that uh, ensures that they follow the regulation. So if you want to speak to it, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I, uh, as a member of the uh, Source Protection Management Committee, I can put the request to the committee to give us further information on what they're, where they're heading with this and what, what the intent is going forward and, and ask them to get back to council on that matter. If, uh, 
That's agreeable. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Luke. I guess because I sit with Diane on the Emergency Management Committee as well, that uh, we, we would be interested in maybe having that information and that discussion with that committee. Thank you. Any further questions on the communi communications? So, oh, and uh, we have three information reports this evening. There's uh, one about borrowing capacity, and it's there for information. I don't know if anybody wants to speak to it. Any questions on it? The intent is that we'll come back with a policy on debt on uh, how we will implement our, or how we will uh, manage our long-term debt. Councillor Dave Mayap. I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I hate to see this go by without some comment, and I, I do this more on behalf of my uh, missing counselor friend, Mike Myatt, across the room there, because I know he was the one that requested this report some time ago, and he, uh, he, he was specifically looking for how much uh, available debt room we have, being that uh, there are potentially a couple of uh, rather large projects on the horizon for our municipality, and and uh, it was trying to gain a comfort level. So um, I'm seeing two numbers here. And just for clarification, there's a 49 million number and there's a 36 million number. And I'm trying to, in my own head, figure out which one is the one that applies to how much our borrowing capacity, our borrowing capacity is. If I may, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, so the $36 million number, um, takes into account our current level of debt that we already have. So that's approximately $13 million of debt that we currently have. Um, so that takes the $49 million down to $36 million. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But the real number there is 19. The real number is $19 million because there's... Uh, the contingency fund, which we must maintain under the under the policy, it takes 12 million off the 36, and then four, almost five million of that is committed to rate-funded borrowing. So, in terms of the projects that you're talking about, which are going to be which are going to be tax-funded projects, the real borrowing limit is 19 million 112,592 dollars. Yeah, as suggested by the, po the the potential policy. Yeah, you're right. <coughs> so. It Go ahead, Councillor Minaj. M Mr. Mayor, isn't there a threshold percentage on that number, though, that you, thou shalt not go to 19 million, or, or is it already included in that threshold? Maybe. Do you want to try explain the report? It. it, it you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll try. So, our debt policy stipulates that 45% of our debt can be uh, to tax funded debt. Um, so that is the 22 million less our current debt of th approximately 3 million. So the 19 million is already the percentage. Is that 45 percent? Okay. I, I um, you know, I, th I th put, put the report, thank Mark because he put the report to, together very very well I think and it gives you some very good guidelines you know and it gives you an idea where you can where we can get some money if we really need it uh, but I you know I say always these are numbers that you use in 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 the context of setting budgets and long-term plans and uh, it's like your household budget you wouldn't go out and borrow every, none of us would go out and borrow every cent against our house for something we would always say you would have a reserve or something like this. So I really like the way they put this together. When we bring it back as a policy, I'm sure we'll have a good discussion on it. So the next item then is uh, there's an information report, and it has to do with the organizational review. And our CIO, I don't know if you want to speak to it, and we'll take any questions. <coughs> no questions? There you go. Fine. Then the next item is uh, position recruitment. And again, uh, there's a report there about uh, position recruitment. And Mr. Gibb, questions? None. Then we'll take a motion. Oh, you were lucky. <laughs> go ahead. I just wondered if uh, 
perhaps the CAO could answer the question. They say the, the, the comment is made there that the orphan list is rapidly shrinking and the town is well served. Do we, what did, do we know what the number as of today in the, of the orphan number of orphan patients is? Yes, the latest number that I've had through you, Mr. Mayor, is about 300 people, and uh, that comes and goes as, as physicians come and go. Um, it's moving, but it was at a high, uh, I understand, of uh, almost 2,000 uh, not too long ago. Further questions on it? Was it really good news that we're getting more doctors? If not, a motion to adjourn. On, and the Deputy Mayor, all in favour, we'll, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes at day 8, 832.